morning. It's uh, 10 o'clock East Coast time. We still have quite a few people joining us, so I would like to suggest that we have uh, about another one to two minutes for us to um, allow the rest of the folks to join us. We'll get started in, at uh, 10.02. Yeah, 10.02. And if I could ask that uh, people, if you're not speaking, mute your mics, please. See you later, Bob. All right. Bye-bye, Warren. This gave me the link to the DCF meeting. This is not the DCS meeting. I got that though, but the other one didn't work either. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Have a good meeting. All right. Thanks, Warren. Okay. Okay, I now have a 10.02.
East Coast. And let's go ahead and get started with the meeting. Uh, point to you, point you to a um, uh, the chat or um, any uh, uh, information that you wish to share. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I just want to point to it and say that the link for signing in for attending the meeting is uh, posted in the chat room. Um, so if you haven't seen it uh, or you have not signed in, I uh, would appreciate if you could do that. My name is Bo Bacchus. I'm with the, um, the Applied Physics Lab supporting NOAA, NESDIS, specifically the joint venture uh, underneath OSAP. And I'm uh, going to be your host, uh, well, I should say uh, the, um, the speaker uh, for this morning to get us started. And I'd like to um, go ahead and get started with the broad agency announcement. Uh, for demonstrating the digital twin for Earth observations and assessing the benefits for the NOAA mission. If this is not the meeting that you intended to um, uh, be at, I kindly ask you to depart and we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. So, wanted to uh, start off with, this is a timeline that we're going to follow. Uh, we're currently uh, going to do some presentations uh, from about 10 to 11 Eastern. Yeah. Introductions, uh, opening acquisition remarks uh, from, from uh, our uh, team and uh, the NESDIS joint venture program will give you an overview of what that is uh, and a little bit of an overview of what the community day is and ground rules as well as uh, go into some of the details of uh, the um, Earth Observing Digital Twin uh, announcement. At 11 o'clock we'll have uh, General, um, yes, Lynn. Just checking that you're recording. Thank you very much, yes. Um, make a, uh, folks, we are recording this session um, to let you know that uh, the session is being recorded and uh, we'll have uh, a transcription uh, made as well. The um, general questions and answers uh, at 11 o'clock uh, and for, uh, at 11.40, we'll go into more focus for small business, answering specific questions relating to, to uh, the small business uh, attendees. And then at 11.55 Eastern, we'll, go, uh, we'll have closing remarks. And then uh, this afternoon, and also on the 16th Monday in the afternoon, we will go into one-on-one -on -one sessions, each session being 20 minutes apiece. And, uh, and uh, we've had a sign-ups, and I believe most every uh, Sign-up slide is currently um, filled. Next slide, please. So, as uh, mentioned earlier, going in plenary session, it's being recorded. The uh, link for signing in is in the chat box. Um, and um, will these slides be made available to the attendees? Um, I'm going to answer questions, and we'll get into the questions section. Uh, later, but I believe that question we probably should answer right now. Uh, will these slides be made available? And Gabby, the answer is yes, the slides are available. Uh, if you do have questions, I ask that you put them into, um, into the chat message. We'll redo the, um, uh, Harshesh will put the sign in link uh, in again for those who. Uh, uh, joined us after uh, he posted the first time, and um, and if you uh, have any questions, please put them in. I will during the question period. I will make sure that we get them answered, and uh, if we are not able to answer them directly, we will get those answers to you no later than the 18th of May, which is next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday. Um, I'm sorry, a week from Thursday. NOAA team uh, questions. Um, for the, uh, I'm sorry, for the one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, which will also be recorded, there will be 20-minute private discussions. Um, we will uh, have the uh, core government evaluation team and AGO will be representing NOAA at these one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. Uh, questions will be recorded so that we can uh, review them and provide you with accurate answers. Uh, any non-proprietary questions that pertain to all the potential responders will be posted publicly so that everyone will benefit. 
uh, and questions that cannot be answered in the one-on-ones will be taken as actions and responded to before the 18th of May. Next slide, please. So our agenda, as we went through before, go through the welcome and introduction, uh, a little bit about the, um, uh, our director will present a little bit about uh, the joint venture program. And the goals uh, are, are um, goals of Earth uh, Observation Digital Twin um, Broad Agency Announcement, our chief scientists will go into. And uh, the um, process itself, and contacts for questions, and the Q&A ses uh, session will be held by our contracts officer. And, um, and then we'll have closing remarks, and our day will be done uh, for the plenary session. So, next slide, please, and introduce uh, our director, Lynn Mayo. Lynn? Good yeah, thanks, Bo. Um, so, again, my name is Lynn Mayo. I am the program director for Joint Venture. I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, glad you can, can make it, and we're excited about this, this project. So, if you don't know Joint Venture, Joint Venture is a relatively new program under the OSAP, which is the Office of System Architecture and Advanced Planning. And our mission really is to leverage the capabilities um, being developed by industry like you all, like from academia, for other federal partners, and how do we leverage that, that technology to provide high, high return on dollars for, for NOAA's funds. Um, we have a number of different things that we do, but these BAAs is a big part of the, the joint venture program. Um, it's really, I think, an interesting and a new way to basically help meet NOAA's um, needs. And what we do with the, the technology um, evaluations that we do is what we're trying to do is really look at how do we incorporate or can we incorporate emerging technologies into operational environment. So we're not doing research for the sake of research. We really want to look at is this something and all these um, technologies that we can you know, put into the operational um, environment. But at this point, there is no plans for that. Um, it's really kind of doing that investigation. Can we re reduce the risk? Can we see that this might be appropriate? And what we're doing is we're looking at it as an enter um, enterprise architecture. As you may know, NISIS is really trying to go with the enterprise, really looking at everything. So we will look from you know, geo to leo to space to ground. It's really all of the, the NISIS operations we address through, through joint venture. So again, a new exciting program. Um, we hope to see from us every year. We plan on probably announcing um, te um, new technologies under BAAs that we want to investigate. So next slide. Um, some of you may not be as familiar with BAAs or, or broad agency announcements. Um, you may be more familiar with RFPs. So I want to just talk really quickly about why we're doing a broad agency announcement versus an RFP. And really the benefit of these broad agency announcements is it really lets us to look at all the potential technologies without actually knowing exactly what you know we want you to do with into the minutia. You know, this is not an RFP where you know we've already set you know, very strict criteria that we instead we want really you to, to help us identify what are the emerging technologies out there, what new exciting things are out there that we can look at. So we purposely, um, although we do have a lot of details in the VAA, we also try to keep it broad. So we can really get the best of what's out there, what industry, what academia, what other federal agencies are doing. And so really, the um, again, the end result is really something that will help us look at how we can possibly implement it. And I think with this um, digital twin, it's really an interesting project. We're really interested to hear what you guys have to say in this area. And, and again, welcome and we're glad that you've uh, joined us. We hope you um, find this of interest, find something that you're interested in. and and we look forward to reading your suggestions and white papers. So thanks, Bo. Thank you very much, Lynn. And uh, I'd like to go to the next slide. And, um, and uh, presenting this will be our chief scientist, Sid. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to uh, be here with you guys and uh, introduce you why we, uh, we see that the digital twin for Earth observation is important to us. Uh, so I'm Sidhu Kabari, physical scientist in the Office of System Architecture and Advanced Planning. For those who are not really familiar with NOAA, NOAA has multiple line offices. The one that we belong to is the Nestis line office, and it's uh, dedicated to the 
deployment of satellite data and uh, generating uh, data from, from those uh, space assets. So there is a, a whole set of uh, processes that need to happen before that data become useful to our customers and to the prediction systems that uh, we run in another life of the same in Mars. So those processes include uh, the ingest of the data, the quality control of that data, the monitoring of the trend of that data, but also consolidating that data and fusing it with other sources of data beyond satellite data in order to provide an analysis that uh, gets uh, delivered to our users. So we believe that digital twin technology could help us with that process, and that's why you see that there's sort of there uh, summarizing the different steps in that uh, process that we hope that uh, DT will, will uh, uh, improve um, in the future. So it will streamline the satellite data ground processing, that a system that uh, goes from ingest all the way to the dissemination of the data. And uh, we are hoping that we will demonstrate that this digital twin technology will help us in our planning for the next generation ground enterprise system in operations in the 2030-2040 timeframe. Um, so this is our exploratory project that we are uh, initiating in order to see if that technology indeed uh, help us in, uh, in that endeavor. Um, we are looking for the best approaches to achieve this uh, digital print. So we are hoping to leverage through this uh, partnership, leverage what has been done in perhaps other fields um, to create a digital replica of the Earth environment. Um, uh, the different components of that uh, Earth environment, be it uh, the atmosphere, the ocean, the cryosphere, all the way to the space level. Go to the next slide, if you can. So you will see in the BAA content that uh, we are seeking partnership with uh, all types of partners, uh, be it for the sea, URC, academia, or private uh, sector, or other government agencies. And the end goal, uh, as I was alluding to, is really exploring this digital twin technology for improving our mission of the future for processing environmental data from ingest to dissemination. Um, what we are planning to do, for those who are familiar with uh, our, uh, our business, we provide two types of data, radiometric data and geophysical data. The radiometric data, for those who are not really familiar, are the raw data that the satellite measures. Ionic temperature, the radiances, the geophysical data are the, um, the transformation of the raw data into um, information like temperature and moisture and surface parameters and so on. So we would like to have both types of data in that digital twin. And uh, an important aspect of what we want to do is, is show a proof of concept. So we want to demonstrate a digital twin with few parameters in all these Earth system components. But design it in a way that is expandable easily so that if this is successful, then we would be basically expanding this to all the Earth system component uh, variables. Go to the next. Thank you. So, what does success look like? Um, we highlighted uh, a few bullets here to um, show folks what, uh, what we are expecting to have for this project. But the BAA will give you uh, further details in terms of uh, specific characteristics. So, first of all, we want to have, uh, like I said, a flexible digital twin uh, system that will allow the users, either public user or specific system that use this data for weather prediction process, easy access and, um, and kind of tailored access. We want them to be able to basically tailor what they want in terms of parameters, in terms of region, in terms of temporal. Uh, period that they would like to um, they would like to assess. We would like vis visualization tools to be associated with this digital twin. We want to be able to see the, the Earth environment from, from the depth of the ocean to the space weather, uh, how, how it evolves, so trends, environmental uh, time series and trends, as well as uh, the spatial uh, distribution of those data in, in the X, Y axis as well as the, in the vertical axis. We would like to be able to ingest several input files. So the idea of the digital twin, the, the main objective, is to offer the users a, a stable interface to get the data that they want from, from the, the digital twin. But in, uh, uh, in terms of input, we would like to be able to provide different inputs, satellites coming at different times, covering different areas, 
all of them would be merged into that digital twin. So the, the system should be able to ingest several input files uh, of different formats from different satellites, but also from both space satellites and ground-based um, uh, observing systems. The gradient of that digital twin should be flexible. We can have it uh, either uniform or non-uniform gradient, so that should be um, modulated by the user's needs. And um, one bullet there that's important, the grid value, in case you have multiple satellites coming or the, the, the collocation of satellites with ground-based measurements, for instance, what we are seeking is a mechanism to fuse those data into one single value. So using perhaps machine learning or computer vision or other efficient techniques uh, to fuse those observing systems into a, a grid of value. Um, the other aspect uh, that's perhaps not in this uh, slide but is in the BAA is that uh, you might have gaps and you expect that the, uh, uh, the project would make use of MWP forecasts to fill those, those gaps. Um, effort should be made to standardize the, um, the digital twin for Earth observations with other digital twin efforts, especially those in NASA. Um, there are many projects going on, so it would be a, a good measure to try to uh, standardize and make those digital twins interoperable as much as possible. So an effort of coordination is expected as part of this project. Um, the output aspect in terms of format should be um, compatible or we should strive at least to be compatible with the NOAA systems. Um, I think we're not uh, in the BAA specifically mentioning any particular format, but we are encouraging towards a format that's compatible with the NOAA systems like the GSI and the UFS. The computer processing time is expected to be less than 10 minutes for processing a full global digital thing. And we'd like to obviously document the lessons learned out of this project in order to see how we move forward um, after this project in terms of uh, planning this in the next generation ground uh, enterprise. And I think that's the end of uh, my uh, contribution here. Bo? Thank you very much, Nick. We could go to the next slide. And uh, we have... Uh, oh, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Sid. Old man's disease here. I keep doing this. Um, so what we have here is, um, and thank you very much, uh, for that, um, wanted to talk a little bit about the software development approach. The, uh, software, um, development, we have a preference to follow the agile implementation approach, uh, with supported frequent, uh, technical interactions. Um, between the developer and, uh, um, and, and a um, uh, skilled uh, government team. Uh, this would give us the ability to do quick adaptation in cases of challenges, uh, direction for development work to go, and also provide strong alignment of the activities with uh, expectations, many of those that uh, you just heard. Um, this effort uh, would be followed and guided on a, um, on a more strategic level uh, by a government-supported team of experts who will provide uh, critical information that's needed and, uh, and, and uh, working to assist with uh, ensuring that uh, this is moving towards um, the expected goals. Um, just to say, though, that uh, while uh, we have a preference to follow the Agile implementation approach, we're definitely open to an alternative approach in uh, the software development. Uh, and so if there is a uh, better or a more practical uh, approach towards the software development, uh, we would be open to, open to considering that as well. Next slide, please. So the two-step process uh, to the VAA, uh, that'll be discussed by our contracts officer. And um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Kevin Bravo. Kevin. Mm, thanks, Bill. I'm Gabby Rowley, I'm the contracting officer um, supporting this BAA. Uh, I sit with the Acquisition and Grants Office, um, which uh, reports the staff. Um, so anyway, this slide really just kind of lays out the entire process of how you are going to interact with the BAA and how we're going to go about reporting the studies that we ultimately choose to move forward with. Um, so in phase one, uh, we're soliciting white papers from, um, from industry on concepts that are responded to the technical content of the BAA. 
Um, so in this phase, you'll submit your white papers, which are not to exceed five pages and should include quad charts and other requirements that are listed specifically in the DAA itself. Those white papers will be reviewed by a technical evaluation board that are going to be looking at several different um, areas of evaluation, including technical merit, past performance, and price, where technical merit is really the most important thing we're looking for. So as Lynn had said before, the, the point of the DAA is really for us to kind of get the state-of-the-art ideas in the different areas that we're looking into. Um, and then looking at the white papers, the technical team can kind of determine which of those ideas are going to best serve the NESDA's objectives in the future. Um, so once that evaluation is complete, a subset of those white papers will be selected to move to phase two of the process. Um, at that point, everyone will be notified whether they have either moved on to stage two of the process or whether they have not been selected to move on um, at this time. If you were not selected to move on, um, I believe somewhere in the DAA, um, it says that the white paper can be reselected at a later time, up to a year after the date of submission. So if for some reason more funding like fell out of the sky into our lap, we could decide to go ahead and, and choose some more of the more technically um, salient white papers that we would have been interested in. Uh, so if you do receive an invitation for proposal to move on to phase two, that selection will be based on the strength of the concept and our available funding. The DAA lists kind of like the, the overall ceiling of funding available for this project. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of partnering and collaboration, there's quite a bit more information about the different entities that we're looking to work with in the DAA, so definitely please go through that carefully. Um, forming a team with other interested entities to submit a response to this DAA is certainly an option. Um, in the case of partnering agreements, though, the prime or the team lead organization is going to be responsible for putting in place all agreements, all committee agreements, and all relevant subcontracts for the completion of your proposed study. Um, your response should submit, your response submitted to the white paper should include a description of each team member's role. Um, and when the white papers or proposals are submitted, they should always be submitted by the team lead or prime organization. Um, the government will not assume any responsibility for management of team relationships. So that would be on the team member, lead, and the prime. Um, next slide, please. So the target timeline that we have right now, uh, the receipt of white papers is scheduled for May 27th, uh, which is listed in the DAA. At that point in time, um, the technical evaluation team will review the white papers, and we expect to have the release of the invitation for proposal to those selected to move on to phase two by June 23rd. Um, at that point in time, we'll have additional, um, additional weeks to put together a more detailed proposal on your concept. Uh, and the proposal submission would be scheduled around July 14th, with the ultimate goal of having contract award completed by September 2nd but no later than September 26th, because that's when our fiscal year will close at NOAA. Um, next slide, please. Um, then kind of, I'm, I'm Gabby Bravo, as we have already discussed. I'm the contracting officer. Um, I'm supported by Brighton Curtis, who's also on this call. Um, he's the contracting specialist for this effort. Um, as you have questions and things that come up where you um, have concerns, you should reach out to me in Britain, and we're the sole points of contact for any exchanges of information. So send us an email. We will distribute it as necessary to technical leads if it's a technical question, or if it's a contracting question, we'll provide the responses to you as timely as possible. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so that our contact information is listed here. Um, you can follow up with any questions or if you have um, concerns about instructions, uh, those are the email addresses that you should reach out to. Um, and speaking of questions, I believe that brings us to our, the beginning of our Q&A session, a little, a little early, so it gives you guys a little extra time. Um, so if you have any questions right now, um, you can drop them into the, the chat box 
uh, what we're going to do is we'll go through, read the questions kind of in order that they come, and either provide an answer if it's something that we know the answer to now. If it's very technical, we'll go back and we'll provide you, as both you mentioned, um, responses by the 18th. Uh, if you were a small business, there's like a, a chunk of time starting at 11.40 at 11.40 or 20 minutes from whenever we start this. Um, if you're a small business, there will be like your own section if you have questions that are related to your small business status or any concerns you have like, as a small business doing uh, business with the government. You can save your questions for that time if you would like. So I guess with that, Hershesh, I will kick it over to you for the q and Thank you, Gabby. I'll, uh, uh, I have one question for you. And uh, definitely encourage everyone to start submitting questions. Uh, first question is, will the same tech evaluation board uh, also evaluate the cost and other non-technical aspects? No, the, the cost will be evaluated by the, the contracting team. Um, obviously, in conjunction with the technical evaluation board to ensure that proposed labor and all of those types of things are realistic for the, the technical being proposed. Um, but the price will be evaluated by the Senate. Thank you. Uh, next one also for you, Gabby, is can you please elaborate on the software licensing terms of the contract? The BAA mentioned the government will own the code, but does not clarify participants' ability to use the code later themselves, for example. I believe we're still kind of working that out, um, but we will have a more we will have a more definitive answer to that question later. Thank you. Sid, this one is for you. Does this EODT focus on satellite data only? No, it doesn't. If you go to section F of the BAA, it lists all the sensors that we're focused on. It's true that most of them are satellite data, but we do have also a focus on the ground based measurements as well. Thank you, Sid. This next one is also for you. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss. Is there any minimum techno technology readiness level, TRL, for proposed technologies related to this BAA? I do not believe that we mentioned anything about TRL for the BAA. Um, we might have to get back to you <clears throat> on this one, because I think we talked about previous experience of the BAA. So let's, let's table this as, um, as a question we need to get back to later on. Thank you. Um, this one, I'm not so sure. Gabby, I'll start with you and, and possibly Sid. Can you discuss some of the U.S. government agencies with which NOAA wants to partner? I don't think I have a preference for any particular uh, agency. I mean, any government agencies would qualify as long as they have the interest and, and the experience in digital technologies. So for a government agency, you have to, there are, um, on page four of the BAA, there's some guidelines that you need to follow where uh, you must clearly demonstrate that work is not otherwise available from the private sector, um, because there are some restriction and competition um, clauses that we need to be mindful of. However, again, kind of going back to what Sid said, um, we aren't looking to work with a specific agency. We would be, if the restrictions on competition were, um, were met, we would be looking to go with the solution that best informs where best is going to move in the future. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, will go to, to Sid. Um, can you speak to integrating government provided data readers and algorithms? For example, types of source code, compiled binaries or APIs, et cetera. So that's a good question. The, um, it's important to uh, highlight that the uh, vendors, there would be an internal government team that would provide technical support to the vendors, and part of that effort would be to provide sample files as well as readers to go with them to allow you to, so source code to allow you to uh, read those files. Uh, I'm not sure about the integrating aspect of it, but there would be sample files as well as readers and source codes to allow you to read those uh, 
uh, those uh, data along with uh, potential libraries of uh, the required libraries. Thank you. And, and Sid, this next one also um, goes to you. Does this DODT prefer to develop an existing DT framework platform or from scratch, basically ground zero? No preference. Um, I think uh, if you have uh, something that exists already and you like to adapt it to um, Earth observations, that's great. Um, if you have experience in digital tutoring and you'd like to start from scratch, um, that's fine. We, we don't have a preference either way. And we have no further questions. Are there any other questions? Well, I think there is one right before this one that we missed. Um, ah, thank you, Sid. From a platform compatibility, what are the major NOAA systems to consider? Thank you. We listed two systems in the EAA. Um, that is, we gave them as examples, the GSI system, uh, the Global Data Estimation System, uh, that we call GSI, as well as the UFS. The UFS is the Unified Forecast System that NOAA is working on to generate the, the future of the forecasting systems in, uh, in, in the decade. Um, so that, that's actually a good question because digital twin is usually understood in the community as uh, the system that would allow you to do what if scenarios. What we're focusing on here is really the digital twin for the Earth observation, so to give you the monitoring aspect of the Earth environment. And the purpose, as we uh, mentioned in the BAA, is to down the road hook this to the forecast aspect of digital twin. So the UFS is the forecast system that NOAA is working on. So that's why we are seeking that uh, compatibility with that UFS system in order to uh, couple the observing system aspect with the forecasting aspect. And therefore, later on, we will be able to, to do the what if scenarios uh, to assess the impact of observations and forecast capabilities. Thank you, Sid. This next one goes to you. Can you share more about what you hope the system will do for interpolation and correction of the data using machine learning? Um, I think this is uh, for interpolation and correction of the data using machine learning. So to give you examples, perhaps is the best way to, um, to explain this. In terms of correction, I'm assuming it's about anomaly correction. Um, so in satellite data, you have a, a way to expect the data have a way to uh, vary with, with time and with uh, the region that it's covering and so on. And sometimes there is an anomaly. And there are systems that should be, this system should be able to detect that and correct it by removing it. This is an example of what we are hoping to, to achieve with, with this with machine learning. So there will be a training done, I'm assuming, with uh, data that is not impacted and data that is impacted, and therefore you'll be able to detect anomalies and correct them. In terms of interpolation, um, I think there is a room for interpretation there for, for this question. I'm assuming that uh, what you mean is what the question is referring to is the interpolation for cases where there is a gap in certain grids where you don't have observations. Uh, the assumption there is that uh, machine learning or computer vision techniques will be used in order to combine observations where they exist with uh, forecast background to get you the information in the grid where, where you don't have the observations. I hope I answered that question. Otherwise, if there's follow-up questions, we can take that offline and get back to you. Thank you, Sid. And this next one is also for you. The scope of effort is quite comprehensive, encompassing machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, data simulation, data fusion, modeling, software system architecture. What is the expected time length of the project in this activity? It seems challenging for all the uh, capability to be provided by a single institution. Will proposals be selected such that there is team coordination? And I, I misspoke, maybe this is more for Gabby. Uh, yes. Um, so it, it didn't look like it was a question. Um, so as we mentioned before, we the government isn't going to be placing ourselves in a role of managing teams. If you would like to propose a team effort on as part of your white paper, 
and pull in different you know, businesses if you wanted to work with um, like a research lab or academia and you wanted to kind of put a team together in best minds that is absolutely possible um, you just need to let us know that what your team arrangement is who the prime who the primary team lead for that link would be and you would be submitting your white paper as one entity uh, which would be managed by the, the team lead or the prime and um, the, if you were selected to move to stage two, it would be the process and the awarded study. That study would be awarded to the prime entity, and then the prime would be responsible for these and with all of the other um, members of the team. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. This next one is, is for Sid. Sid. Yeah, very good. I think there's a technical component to that question that I'd like to address if you allow me. Absolutely. Um, it, it is it is true that uh, the scope is quite encompassing and um, some of the companies might not be very familiar with, with our business and it was by design because we wanted to leverage digital technologies as they happen in, in different fields and that's why these these projects will be um, guided by a government team to provide guidance that we, when there's a need to make a decision one way or another but also will be supported by a tactical team to provide, like I was alluding to before, uh, sample files, formats, and readers, and so on. Um, and so that's that's uh, that's an element that I wanted to highlight here to make sure that the uh, potential offers are, are aware of. Now, in terms of um, uh, the main focus of the BAA, like we put in the in the text of the BAA, is really generating a digital print system. So the software system architecture is really uh, one of the major components of this. We will be working with these government teams to provide, if there is an AI algorithm that already exists, we will provide that uh, in order to hook it to the digital print infrastructure. Thank you, Sid. And this next one is also for you. Um, can you speak more about the 10 minute timeline for the digital twin? Yeah, that is, that is the expected um, processing time that we are um, targeting for processing a full, a full global digital twin. I think that that's basically what this 10 minute, um, and that's based on expectations, based on algorithms, that are, that are based on AI and machine learning that were developed in the past. In, in the world. Thank you. Next question is also for you. Is the goal to visualize the NOAA satellite data individually and a fused product, or only the data fused product globally? So that, that's a good question uh, that merits clarification. The, the uh, visualization is really about the digital twin output, not the input. So whatever the output is in terms of digital twin, so the global uh, fused product, um, it is global by default, but we are hoping that that uh, digital twin could be um, modulated by the user's need. So if the user wants just a portion of that, then, then that's the output that we'd like to visualize. So it's more for the output than the input. Thank you, Sid. And this, uh, this next question is also for you. Does NOAA want a digital twin of the satellites and their ability to observe Earth science phenomenology, or just an Earth model that incorporates the various data archives for machine learning purposes. So it's it's the first one. It's a digital twin of uh, the satellite and other observer systems in, in their ability to observe and monitor the Earth science technology. Uh, not the model. We are not at this point. We are not seeking digital twin for the modeling aspect or the prediction aspect. It's really for Earth observation, and that's what we. EO in the EODT stands for. Um, going back in the archives, no, that's not what we are seeking. I think in the BAA we said explicitly that we're seeking a, a moving window of two weeks of data. So that's that's the extent of um, what we're hoping. So the digital twin would be running, process 15 days, um, look at the output, how it evolves, how it dynamically it changes. Um, assess the uh, trend, the time series during that period, then we move that window, uh, the, the length of that window will always be 15 days. Or a 
as, as seen fit by, by the author. But we're not planning on going to the archives and, and doing um, machine learning applications. Thank you, Sid. This next question is, is also technical. For you, is there an expectation to only use NOAA affiliated data? Also, is the machine learning uh, machine learning usage only related to Earth observation super resolution anomaly detection slash correction? Is there any scope of using machine learning to build models for tracking environmental prognostics? Um, no, we don't necessarily look only for NOAA data, and like I was saying in the beginning, the, the hope is that the design would be flexible enough that we can extend it to, um, to other sources of inputs, including the NASA satellite data, for instance. Um, so it is for Earth observation, and not necessarily super resolution, I don't know what's meant by that, but it's uh, the Earth observations as measured uh, at the original resolution. Some of them might be high resolution, some of them, some of them might be lower resolution. Um, is there a scope to using machine learning to build models for tracking environmental prognostics? No, if that's meant uh, for climate applications and things like that, no, that's not the scope of this. This is again the digital frame for monitoring, assessing the state of the environment as it happens with some time trends assessment associated with it. Um, but it's not in the scope to, to do prediction of uh, environmental uh, phenomenology. Thank you, Sid. This next question might be both of you. Um, start with you, Sid. Are there any points of reference out of MITRE that would be useful? I, I don't know how to answer that question. I think I would need more more details about what's meant by that. Okay. Thank you. I also I wouldn't be sure. So uh, next question is is uh, for you said will NOAA experts be responsible for providing labeled data for training machine learning algorithms such as anomaly detection? I hesitate to answer this question on the fly, but the one thing I'm sure about is that label data has a special meaning, and no, we are not committing to provide label data for training. No. What we are planning to do is have the tactical team on the government side work with you to provide sample files and guide you through um, what constitutes an anomaly, what doesn't constitute an anomaly. Um, but I think what is meant there is, is very specific about uh, AI labeled data. But that's not something that we're committing at this point. Thank you, Sid. We are getting near the end of the question, so if there are further questions, I invite uh, everyone to please submit them in the chat. Uh, this next question goes to Gabby. Um, if we propose a solution based on an existing product, would the government need to own the code of initial solution as well? No. Um, anything that you've developed on your own or that has been developed by someone else using their own development dollars is owned by the person who did, or the entity that developed it. Anything that is developed using government dollars, we would want to own the code to um, but any pre existing ones. Okay. That is it for the questions. Uh, if there's any further questions, please put them in the chat. We do have a follow-up question. Um, would we need to provide data rights? This would go to Gabby. Would we need to provide data rights? So if you if your solution was selected to move forward um, into the study phase and you're issued a study contract, um, there would be data rights clauses involved in that. Um, that I, depending on what the solution was and what type of code, I, again, not the technical person, uh, we would have to discuss the data rights of that kind of that time. Um, okay. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I'm not sure, but I think this one goes for you, Sid. Um, 
Thanks for the great session. As a follow-up, the BAA mentions interpret, uh, interpretability, uh, explainability for machine learning models. Could you please elaborate on that, since there are no predictions to be made using machine learning? Yes, so machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms in general, uh, you can need the training, um, sort of uh, blinding and see what, what comes out of it, but there are now techniques to ensure that the results are what they are for the reasons that they're expected. So that's, that's part of the interpretability and explainability of, of the machine learning. This is important for NOAA because we want to make sure that the uh, machine learning algorithms are giving us the results for the good reasons, and not just because of uh, the easiness of the training and, and things like that. So there are techniques to ensure that uh, the ML algorithms are interpretable and explainable, um, and I invite you guys to uh, explore those techniques and um, make them part of, uh, of the uh, proposed methodology. Thank you, Sid. There are no further questions currently. So if there's any additional questions, I invite you to please put them in the chat. With these with these questions, I want to um, thank everybody for for ah here we go. Um, this one is is for you, Sid. What is spatial slash temporal resolution expected for a ten minute processing? Those those details are actually in the BAA text. Um, we go into it's it's flexible. We give. Uh, of a target that uh, we say that it's variable. So spatial and temporal resolution would be variable, uh, modulable, um, but we are giving um, specific information of uh, what the target is. It's a soft target that you want uh, in, the, in the BAA text. Okay, thank you, Sid. Um, If we don't have any more general questions, which um, these have been excellent questions, um, possibly we may want to consider going to the small business uh, portion of the question and answer period. I know we are a little bit early, but um, it appears that we have uh, answered uh, all of the questions that we can. Ah, we do have one more. Um, is the idea that, uh, this one would be for Sid, is the idea that the 10 minute processing would eventually supplement or replace data at the simulation for the weather models? That's an excellent question. I mean, obviously this is exploratory, we don't know how it's gonna work. Um, but the idea is we really infuse efficiency in how we are doing what we call data fusion and data assimilation, yes. So, so the digital twin output uh, in the BA text, we mentioned that the users could be actual users, forecasters, looking on the desk of the data and trends of data and so on, but they could be systems. So the digital twin output could be actually input to the data, to the uh, forecast system. So in that sense, yes, it, it could be explored as a as a supplement or as a replacement to data assimilation of, of the future for weather models. And uh, actually, I could, uh, if you get me started, I could go on for a long time for that because the, the data the forecast system is going coupled. So the next generation forecast systems are going to predict the, the weather, the ocean, the land and hydrology and so on in a very coupled fashion to extend the deep time of, of, that, uh, of that forecast, which means that parameters that are not used now for, for, for weather forecasting, for instance, might become important in the future. And that makes the digital twin even more important because it will provide all the data in a consolidated fashion 
in those platform forecast systems. So yeah, it, it's uh, still way far down the road, but uh, in the back of some of us minds is yes, that is something that could uh, potentially supplement the replace data simulation for weather models and, and other coupled models. Great, thank you, Sid. And there are no further questions at this point. Ah, all I have to do is say that. Um, I think this one is for you, Gabby. Is there a restriction on using proprietary ocean sensing data or are all data or all data has to be open sourced? And where can we access the reporting? I guess there's, there's a little bit for Sid and a little bit for Gabby. Um, I'm not really sure. I think the, the open source data might be a question for Sid. Yeah. Okay. And, but, can, uh, but where can we access the reporting? That's a great question. Um, I assume we will send out the slides and the recording um, to all of the meeting attendees who have signed in at sign in sheets. So please definitely make sure you have signed in. Uh, before you tap out if you do have to. Um, and to anyone that was on the invite list, uh, we will follow up with, with all of those resources and the Q&A will, or all of the Q&A questions, even ones we've answered, will be responded to and an amendment to the VAA um, by the 18th, as we mentioned earlier. So you will have a lot of extra information for On um, the first part of that question, uh, I think my answer would be simply to recommend you to look at the section F of the BAA that gives you the examples of, of the private farms that we are expecting for the different components of the OSIS system, including the uh, ocean sensing data. Thank you, Sid. And Then we have reached the end of our questions. And this time it didn't trip anymore. Um, okay. Um, might I suggest that we now move into questions and answer session for small business and take the next uh, 20 minutes to focus on uh, small business question and answers. These will be focused on anything that's specifically uh, of, of concern or of interest to the small business attendees. Do you have a question? And this is for Gabby. Will simplified acquisition procedures be allowed? I think that depends on the proposed, I mean, proposed price for the white paper that you submit. Thank you. Can it be requested? Uh, Gabby, following question. Um, be it can be, I think that means can it be requested? Be it can be requested. Oh, but it can be requested? But it can be requested? Um, yeah. Collins can't get this one. Okay. Um, so simplified acquisition procedures usually cap out at different um, dollar values depending on what type of contract it is. So if you're, if you're, it would depend, I think this question would depend on, on the solution that you're proposing um, and what, whether that falls into categories of like construction or engineering, um, that we might need to discuss that concern offline just because it might be specific to something that you're thinking. I'm happy to do that if you reach out. Follow on uh, to that, 
uh, for clarification is I am asking because of all the technical components that are involved. Why don't we take, if you have this. We can, we can discuss that, I think, maybe at a later time, one-on-one, -on -one, um, Colin, if you wouldn't mind, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I might need to get a little bit more information for you to a conversation before I answer your question, though. We definitely want to get the answer for you. Okay, next question. Um, I believe this one goes to you, Gabby. Practically speaking, what does it mean to NOAA to encourage small businesses to submit white papers? Does NOAA envision giving contracts to small businesses that are not known quantities outside of its pro-tech contractors? Is there a target NAICS code for establishing the size of a small business? Thanks for that question, George. That's a good one. Um, so the, the NAICS code that is being used for this DAA is found in the DAA itself um, on page three. Um, it's 541715, which is the um, R&D and physical engineering and life sciences, except nanotech and biotech. Um, and the small business size standard for that particular NAICS code that we're using for this requirement is 1,000 employees. Um, so that would be what we're using as like the kind of qualifier of what counts in small business for this particular requirement. Um, as for your question to potentially provide contracts to small business, businesses that are not on the project contracts, absolutely. Like we love project contracts and we use them heavily to meet the needs for which they make sense. Um, but we love working with new businesses as well. Um, so if you're not already part of the project, um, different spheres of the project contract, you are absolutely eligible to see a way to end the project. Um, was... uh, the last part, is there a target uh, in AICS code for establishing the size of a small business? So the, the next code we had chosen for this um, requirement is what we already discussed and the size standard for that makes code is about them. Thank you. Um, this next question, I, I uh, we may need some clarification on it, but I believe it goes to you, Gabby. Um, does this EODT open for private small business, not big corporation, right? I believe it meant to say not just big corporations. Yes, uh, we are looking at all technical solutions provided by a variety of businesses and academia and um, government partners. Uh, but as we kind of discussed earlier, the Technical Evaluation Board will go through each uh, white paper, conduct a scientific review, and then the solutions that are selected that best meet NESDIS's needs moving forward will be selected for stage two of the process, regardless of business size. We're not looking to you know, silo it out to different types of entities. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Gabby. This next one is also for you. Does NOAA envision giving multiple awards? Yes, so NOAA envisioned the award of one to two studies for a duration of 24 months each. Um, the entity submitting a white paper would propose the duration of the study and your proposed price. Um, we are looking to examine different types of solutions. Uh, so there's definitely a desire for us to, to award studies to at least two entities um, with the funding that we have available so that there's a way to compare different solutions. Thank you, Gabby. We do not have any more questions right now. So again, invite the audience. This is a question and answer session for small business. Are there any other questions?
Yes. Um, well, I have uh, appreciation for the presentation. Does it appear that um, we have satisfied our audience, all the attendees? Again, last call for uh, questions. Now we know how all those teachers felt in that class. <laughs> well, it's been excellent questions. And um, another appreciation. Thanks, everyone. This is very informative. If you have a question, a technical question, Sid, how did you arrive at the 10 minute processing time? Uh, simply based on previous experience with AI algorithms that were generated in the development in the last few years. More appreciation. And hey, folks. Keep everybody here. If, uh, we have satisfied all of the questions, and everyone is confident that they can write an incredibly award-winning five-page white paper. Um, I'm sure that the uh, technical evaluation board is looking forward to uh, to seeing some amazingly great, well thought out white papers. Great. No questions about Agile? I feel like I just do red meat into here. Okay. Ah, can we have, Gabby, for you? Do we have the opportunity to submit questions after this call? Can you? Gabby, the, there you go. So I'm clicking on any things. I was looking at the calendar and then I got confused. Uh, so we had, we had asked for the questions to be submitted before, but if you, you know, this kind of, it's a lot of new information, you know, we threw it, threw it at you. Um, and some of the other questions may have kind of like tweaked your, your brain. You might have some thoughts. Um, 
why don't we say if you can submit your question by close of business tomorrow, uh, we will consider them as well, just to give us enough time to, to be able to formulate um, well thought out and kind of comprehensive responses to all of these questions, any questions that we received prior, and any questions that come up with the one on one questions. Does that sound okay to you, Dan? So close of business tomorrow. If you have any more additional questions kind of that come to you while you're doing some other tasks not related to this, feel free to drop them by. Um, and we will we will provide responses to those as well by the um, by the week. And, okay, great. You answered the question I was going to ask as well. By the 18th, we will provide the answers. Yeah. I think that's that's fair. It gives us some time to, to consider all of the questions and, and then provide a comprehensive, like full list of Q and A's over. Okay. Great. Okay. So last call. We'll make a last call here for questions. Otherwise, we'll return. We'll return you to uh, uh, give you back about 50, uh, 53 minutes. And uh, just to to as a reminder for those who have signed up for the one on one sessions, um, they will begin uh, on time. Uh, the time again, as a reminder, it's Eastern, uh, Eastern time zone, daylight savings, and they will be 20 minutes each. We're not able to extend those times, so we will try to, to uh, make sure that we have uh, as much a time available for you to, to interact with uh, our, um, uh, our experts and make sure that uh, um, you're able to, to uh, ask uh, if there are proprietary questions and such uh, directly in those 20 minute sessions. Um, otherwise, I would say that uh, we are at um, the uh, closing remarks. And want to uh, first invite uh, if um, Lynn, if you have any last words. Yeah, just appreciate everyone's time. Just appreciate everyone's time. These are really great questions. Um, I'm glad people are thinking about this, and we really look forward to, to hearing your solutions and your, your way, reading your white papers. So again, thanks for everyone taking the time to attend. Thank you, Lynn. And um, Sid? Um, no, nothing. Just to say thank you again also uh, to everybody who participated and thank you for the questions. Okay. And Gabby. Nothing additional from me. Just same thing. Thanks for everyone's participation and all your really great questions. Um, we'll work to make sure that you get responses to all of them and we look forward to your submissions. Great. Thank you, everybody. We are. Um, very uh, uh, happy with your uh, joining us for this. We're very excited about this project. And um, this will conclude our uh, plenary session, uh, our community day. And uh, for those who have signed up for the one-on-one -on -one sessions, we'll see you in those sessions. Otherwise, again, thank you all very much and uh, appreciate your time. This concludes, uh, this concludes our presentation.